Welcome to Finance Video in our second master series. I do believe this is the 37th video in our second master series, and we are going to look at the impulse response aspect and analyze what that is. Now, this has two uses. Like I said later on, it's going to be useful for you to understand this information in all kinds of aspects of audio engineering. And when we're looking at some of the processors that utilize this stuff and some of the processors that are directly affected by this information being either convolved or summed into what's ever happening or causing a different effect to the original sound or as it's passing through pieces of different software hardware. So it's a very complicated subject. And one of the reasons why I'm making these videos is so that basically it's in your mind that it is something that is happening. Now, there's some videos on my my channel about waveforms, different types of waveforms and sound and things like that. So you have an understanding of what you're looking for at as far as the waveform. And we talked about the meters that are probably going to be of most use to you and looking at these waveforms and looking at these impulse and spectrum, uh, spectrum or, or frequency and impulse responses. Now, there's a difference between <clears throat> the first thing we come to is there's a difference between like a stereo version and a mono version you have a mono version of the impulse response it's going to have a different effect than a stereo version it's going to be a more complex impulse response now you can tell just by looking at it that you would think that the room these two mics you know it's a stereo it's a stereo version so the problem is is it looks different for some reason right so there's a lot of factors that can be involved in why those two files look different because the stereo version either side is basically a separate version like two separate mono files that's going to affect it and you can actually affect the waveform by putting some type of processor in the line to put delay on one side or the other or affect one side or the other differently to cause a different effect now basically what we're looking at when we're looking at the waveform here you know, if you look at those videos about waveforms and sound and things like that, you, you'll get a pretty good understanding of what you're looking for. You're basically looking at different levels. Now, the concept here normally with an impulse response is that or a room response it, without the frequency response being part of it or analyzed as part of it, which we'll look in the coming videos, is that basically it's just a level that comes through. Now, this can be complicated because the actual impulse response is not trying to give any information about sound. Does that make sense? So in the first aspect of this, it's just trying to show you early, it, the initial sound, early, late refractions and refraction, refractions, diffractions, diffusions, all kinds of things that it's just showing these levels that are going to be convolved or summed into the other, whatever sound you're you know that they're being applied to um, this a, a direct you know example is a vocal i'm sitting here talking to you on the microphone and the room is reverberating back that sound at different times at different levels right so you know an impulse response is trying to emulate that so you know when we start to look at the impulse response without looking at the frequency response content of it at first is that you know we're looking at you know reverberations so you have this direct sound that's happening and then it starts heading out in all different directions well after it go it's going to eventually make contact so as it makes contact that it's going to hit and it's going to start reverberating off in different directions that eventually are going to eventually if you have the sound source here and you have the microphone here, you're eventually going to have a direct sound. And then at some point, you're going to have reflections, refractions, all, depending on what all is happening in the room or what's in the room and how it's constructed and things like that, of when those things are going to come back and hit the microphone. So you end up with stuff, information like this about direct sound, early reflections, late reflections, and then tail end stuff that's just you know reflections from everywhere that just start trying to convolve into each other that just ends up this kind of light mess that just slowly just kind of fades off into just mass reflections so that's a simple concept you have things like auto di diffraction also depending on where the microphone's at things can be diffracted and bouncing off things 
all over the place. So, you know, those kind of concepts are going to have an impact on that impulse response. You know, you have things like the RT60, you know, analysis to where you've got steady sound and then when the sounds turn off, the natural decay, which is somewhat visible inside when you're looking at an impulse response in this way, like a reverberation impulse response is trying to show some of that information. So all these things I, I recommend you reading about some. And resonances. Sometimes you'll get resonances, lower end bass resonances, higher end frequency resonances, standing waves, all kinds of stuff like that that are definitely going to affect the impulse response and what it looks like and how it affects if it's convolved, if you're using the impulse response like in convolution reverb, or it's just the impulse response coming from the room that you're in, or the impulse response that may be affected by the microphone or other piece of hardware or software or something like that can cause those things so when we're looking at the impulse response later on we're going to talk a little bit about you know reverberations and reverberation effects convolution reverb non reverb and things like that and they are going to affect those levels just the impulse response aspect let's say that this vocal is sitting here and we've talked about this when we were mapping spectrums that you know these levels are going to change right so you're going to it's not going to the impulse response itself isn't directly affecting the frequency content but the levels themselves will be affected so at every moment so if you look at this like right here and you're looking this across here as these things come in here it's going to be hitting this vocal and it and boosting those levels a little bit or drop you know letting a lot of them to drop or boost so you get this vibration effect that slowly decays as things hit so like if you're looking at this here there's a hard hit here then it dies off then it rises up again it rises up again it's rising up there and it's starting to die off there's no hard hit there and then it starts doing a a dive right there towards the end of it now this is an impulse response that i cut down to 10 milliseconds so that i have a really clean impulse response to work with so i don't muddy up mixes but a longer one would be have a lot more of that stuff going on so now while we're looking at that that basically, you know, that's going to affect the levels, you know, as that decays. So it rather than just the sound like an anechoic chamber, that there is no reflections at all, that's just that dead sound that that those that impulse response of those reflections coming back on that sound is basically that sound again, but at different levels coming back and hitting the microphone, or as you see on here, that it's that sounds come back again there 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 you know just the levels themselves as it's dying off and let's say like you look at right here and all of a sudden you get this spike right here for what for some reason it hits something and it's a pretty high level as in comparison to like this level that it got spiked it's way higher than this one here but the level spiked for some reason there because it hit some solid object you know that allowed for a higher level to come back and hit the microphone so <laughs> <coughs> materials have a lot to do with it rather than besides just the effect of the frequency how the materials around the room are you know from the impulse response is going to affect the levels at all you know besides affecting the sound so there's a different frequency content can change the frequency content that it affect the levels it hits something here that absorbed it more so that it came back lighter where here it reflected hard a very hard surface and came back and hit loud here so it's affecting that and sometimes you can get in there with the impulse response you can see that and it's going to affect that sound that you're working on i mean it just is and also, if you look like at this right here, you have this initial sound in yellow, like it's just like a drum hit or something or any kind of sound, you know, just a pop, you know, and then you see that. And then these other lines, you can see this purple and this blue that is going across there. That's reverb on top of it. So it, you, it sometimes like the concept is, is trying to see this is that it can make it very difficult sometimes but if you know what's happening that it can really help you when you're looking at this because sometimes this can be really drastic and sometimes it can be light here it's not real heavy it's fairly heavy because you can see this tail's getting boosted so you can see it's dying off i mean the, it, the level's going up quite a bit here in comparison to this yellow line and it's also tailing off and i've cut it off here so that it 
stays about the same length, but this is more convoluted. So the impulse response is convoluting the other sound. So you have this nice clean sound in yellow, but this impulse response or the reverberations of the room, just the impulse aspect of it, are convoluting it, causing it to be muddier and messier. Sometimes that can be a good thing and add ambience and add a little bit of spatialization and add a little bit of this or that to make it sound fatter or wider or whatever, but it's still convolving it. And, and the impulse response not only is just convolving this or, or you know, convoluting the sound itself, the clarity of the sound, but it's also multiplying any distortions, saturations, noises, and things like that into the sound. And also, it's going to, you know, add, you know, that sometimes that it doesn't look this clean, that you get spikes going on like we're looking at here that are happening along here somewhere because all of a sudden you hit a hard surface, which can cause a few issues in the sound that's happening. But just understand what we're looking at is what we're trying to understand now, you know. There's a bunch of impulse responses that I have here that I use that I've cut down. This is a large hall, like a big old cathedral. I've cut it down to like 50 milliseconds, 30 milliseconds, or 40, 30, 20, and 10 milliseconds. Then I can use different versions of it that I've cut down and then, you know, put a fade on them so that they fade out. That's going to add cleaner reverberation when I use convolution reverb, which can be of immense help when you're doing that. Now, you seeing that information when you're miking a kick drum and trying to isolate it more or less, you know, with padding around it or, or less padding around it or less padding around it, letting the room saturate into it is the same kind of concept that's going to restrict the amount of impulse response coming back into it that's con convoluting the sound. So those kind of concepts are huge and you know it take a little bit of study studying those kind of things and to really understand what you're looking at and looking at some impulse responses you know of what's happening can really help you to understand this concept because this concept these things can be convoluted and polluted by everything from the room to the microphone, to the interface, to other pieces of hardware, to pieces of software that you're utilizing can warp it or convolute it to where it's not having the same effect and it's causing something else to happen. And also, you can edit them, not only besides cutting them down, that once you understand what's going on there, you can clean them up. Or you can combine two different impulse responses to have some other effect. Or bounce a couple of different ones together to have this really strange effect. You know, that's, you know, like if I took and I got in here and I took another convolution reverb, like let's say this one right here, and I drug it right on top of it, and I play, say, I like to like something like play overlaps, then I'd have both these two on top of each other, right laying on top of each other. And it's like, and I can, you know, different reverbs. That's that one there. Then it's about the same reverb. But if I go in here and I say, well, I'm going to use that a medium hall that's C10 also. I'm going to lay it right on top of it. Now I have these two that are going to be convolved on top of each other with aspects of both of them of just the impulse that can thicken them up, thin them out, all kinds of things to cause different type of reverberations. Now, I can put more and more on there and it'll make the reverberation really thick, but very cons very short of like 10 milliseconds, and but it'll really thicken up that sound. It'll sound really thick and wide. And these concepts, there's multitudes of concepts in this because you're understanding what that exactly is. So, I mean, the, the concept isn't really that hard to understand what we're looking at. And I just kind of wanted to point that out. And I'm going to point out the same thing when we look at frequency responses, what exactly we're looking at. So we may have a, a, just a basic understanding of that and the meters that we can look at to look at that. So that later on, as we're trying to apply this stuff to real world things, processors, when we're using microphones and we're recording or we're doing whatever, that these concepts are understood so that we can evaluate its effect on things we're doing or how it's affecting things we're doing to make us a better audio engineer.
And I do suggest you get online and really investigate all the things I talked about and dig in deeper. There's tons of information on my channel also, but I just wanted to just kind of skim it to just kind of point the things out when we're looking at impulse responses. I'll see you in the next.